Hello everyone and welcome to Three Coaches, One Topic. My name is Donna Burfield and tonight I'm joined by uh, with Sylvia and Jihan. Um, so today what we're going to do as always is we're going to have a wheel that will decide what topic we are going to discuss. So nobody knows. Um, so it just makes it a little bit more interesting and spontaneous. And we will be sharing things that have come up for us in the past, things that maybe we've had to overcome. Um, and as we're all coaches, we will hopefully give you some tools and strategies if you're struggling with anything in your life today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Sylvia and Sylvia will tell you a little bit about herself and her coaching business. Sylvia. Thank you, Donna. Good evening, everyone. Sylvia Bottini here. I'm the founder of Be Coach. It's an international practice completely dedicated to leadership development for executives and their team. I operate from uh, Dubai and um, we have uh, Hogan Assessments as well with Be Coached, which is our flagship um, assessment systems that we use extensively with leaders and executives. Thank you. She had. Okay, so hi everyone. Good evening or maybe good afternoon. I don't know who's in here. <laughs> so my name is Jihan Gatti. I'm the founder of Expand Coach, which is a leadership consultancy. Um, so coaching leaders and teams to really go through change uh, with resilience and develop their leadership, but also their performance today for today and for tomorrow, also based in Dubai. But um, yeah, obviously operating everywhere with the online word now. Up to Great. You, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also based in Dubai and I am a joint purpose coach. I'm certified and licensed and I love and adore working with parents and empowering them to have connection and bringing them closer together. Uh, and I also run Coaches Supporting Coaches and CSI at uh, CSI. <laughs> No, it's not CSI, it's CSC Certified Coaches Group. So that's us. So what I will do is let's just take this down and go straight to the wheel. And let's see what we're talking about today. So we have got our oh, good. <laughs> I get excited every time these come up. We've got role models. <laughs> so, right. So how we do this is what we will. Let me just take that away and put this back up. So um, we when we tend to think about role models, we tend to, especially at school, we're asked, who's your role model? And it has to be a famous person. And um, I like to switch that up and say, well, what about people in your immediate community or in your family or past, present as to who's your role model? So does anybody or anything can come to mind when that role model came up? Ouch. <laughs> Or has somebody famous come to mind? No, I think somebody famous, no. It, it actually reminded me, you know, I, before being a coach, I went to a coach personally, not within my work. Um, and I, I, I remember one of her questions was, what's your role model? And I'm like, no one. She's like, no, but there must be someone. And I'm like, no, I, I, I mean, I like some people here and there on a specific subject or a specific trait, but I don't think about the role model. So that's the story that I came into my mind. This role model for me needs to be for specific areas, um, not generic. Like mm -hmm. that's that. So for me, there are three things. One, role model needs to be specific. Second, we use that kind of modeling in um, NLP. In yeah. terms of if you want to succeed in doing something, find someone who's already doing it and then you model the, the, the behavior. And then the third thing is I'm more interested into um, us as parents or our leaders, 
to um, walk the talk and be the role models that you want to to be for for the others around us. Yeah, so that so we'll see how the discussion goes and which way we go deeper into. Yeah, yeah, no, good because I, yeah, I was reading something about NLP last night actually, and it's funny that came up as well. So, uh, Sylvia, what's your take on it? Yes, my take is that I do actually have role models. I do because uh, they are inspirations to me. I always enjoyed, since I was a little girl, that's, uh, that's it, to look up to someone and I was admiring them. So there's admiration in it. And I want to stress this, the concept of admiring someone rather than being jealous of someone because sometimes we can come across a person that is really inspirational and maybe successful and the emotion there is jealousy but for me um, role model is a person i really admire and at the moment i can think of two role models in my life not necessarily female one comes from my family and it is my auntie, the sister of my mother, now 86 year old woman, so energetic, had a great career in sales and is always smiley, positive, although life um, wasn't easy for her. She lost her husband mm -hmm. when she was in her late 30s and had to sustain a family of four herself and, and her three boys, but always a really positive and resilient woman. And the other role model is for me uh, um, a male role model, Nelson Mandela. Again, oh. here I have um, a lot of admiration for him because he was extremely resilient and uh, we could say that at some point in his life there were big failures for him if we think about the fact that he was uh, taken into robin island and i have been to south africa i have been to robin island to see where people were detained like him and i thought wow how did this man manage to stay so many years in prison and eventually achieve what he wanted to achieve Mm. And he eventually seemed such a humble person, approachable, um, and said the secret is also to forgive the people that have um, done something really awful against you. Yeah. All. So these are my two role models. One comes from the family and one is uh, well known, no longer with us, but um, well known. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree with you. I, I like people that have got that resilience and thinking outside the box and going against the norm. Um, I think one of my, um, well, famous ones is Maria Montessori. Um, and, you know, how she was working with children with learning disabilities and saw her approach and... Um, if they if that could help and support them then how is it going to be for other um children and you know during those years so everything that she went through um and i did this many years ago now so this was about 27 years ago so i've lost <laughs> i'm getting old so i keep on forgetting some of the facts so i'll have to reread it but um yeah so her and my role models for life in general are people that I come across um, and I see how people uh, teach, how they uh, interact with their children, you know, so it doesn't have to be anybody specific. But one thing that I have learned is be careful to put those people that you really admire and see as a role model on a pedestal mm -hmm. because they're human. And I remember doing this as a child. There was somebody I saw as a role model who I adored and thought was absolutely fantastic. Then they did something. And through a child's eyes, I did not understand. And I was bitterly disappointed. So it took me, you know, many years to realize well, as I was coming into an adult, hold on a second, they're human. I don't know what was going on in their lives. They acted out of character. So, 
again, as I'm saying, that's where sometimes we have to be a bit careful. What's coming up for you, Jihan, as I'm saying that? Yeah, because when, when you said that, I'm like looking at the language. At the end, it's called the role model, mm. right? It's role. Yeah. It's not, it's not the person. It's not the whole of the person. It's a role. And that role is basically our projection of what we see in them. It's not them. Yeah. And it's, it's, so it, it's already in the wording, it's a role model, it's not a person model, it's not anything like that. So whatever you see in the person, like Sylvia, what you see about your auntie or your or Nelson Mandela is some specific characteristics and your vision of them that you really like. It's not specifically them in their wholeness or as they might be perceived by other people. So I, I find interesting how the language sometimes already have some... Um, some cues on on how we need to perceive these things and can i jump on there as well because what's interesting is apparently when you see strength and positive char characteristics as well as negative in other people this is in you so you know these people that we admire and we break down what are their their personalities you know their character traits and so forth yeah. And where are we displaying that? Uh, yes, definitely. If we can recognize something in other people, uh, it's because we, we know it. We are familiar with that mm. behavior, with that way of thinking. And so we recognize it in other people as well. And we come sometimes to, to admire it. As I said earlier, for me, a role model is a person I admire. But sometimes we come to, to, hate, some, to hate some people, really. And when we somehow hate, we don't realize that we may be projecting onto them uh, characteristics about our personality that we want to disown. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are the, some of the, the traits that you would say you would look into if you could choose a role model? What, what are some of the characteristics and traits that, that you hope they will display or they would display? Asking this question after the, the comments that we made, it's as if so give us more in your personality <laughs> because whatever you would like <laughs> will tell more about us than the others. Um, I love creativity. Mm. Like I know people who go out of the box, um, who create things that are new, um, who provide beauty. So I say beauty, but it's not only the superficial. It's like that feeling when you're seeing something and you're in awe, like, wow, like you, your thoughts just stop and you look at it and oh, how did they even create something like this yeah. or something like, something like this? And, and by definition, for me, these people are very brave uh, because going into the unknown and creating something new that and, and, and publishing it, I mean, putting it out there in the world needs a lot of, of courage. Um, and I admire that. So for me, um, creativity, beauty, courage, and by doing that, it means also they want to have an impact bigger than them and out to the world with what they create. So I think these characteristics of, as I said before, creativity, beauty, courage, and impact, mm. impact, bigger impact outside of them. Beautifully said. <laughs> Thank you. Sylvia, what about you, my dear? Yeah, creativity is a very good one. For me, I would say is um, giving to others. Well, people that have the gift to really share what they know and what they can do with others to be there for others so they're not um, big celebrities or big personalities or big um, drama queens because we can have role models that are very um, focused on themselves especially if you look um, in the TV industry, Hollywood, or some of these are huge superstars with great talents, but constantly looking at their own glory themselves. I like people that show a little bit of, you know, altruism 
I care about you, you other people. I want to share something with you. It's not important how I look or how I dress. It's not about me. It's about giving to, to others and eventually leaving a legacy. That um, uh, it's something, again, as I said earlier, I, I admire. And that's why I mentioned Nelson Mandela, because he could have stayed <laughs> Calm in his yeah. house. He was a lawyer, I believe, had a degree in law. So, be the lawyer he, he was meant to be, and not fight for such an important cause. But he did it, and it was not only for himself. It's been for a lot of other people. Well, we've lost. Uh, we've lost. We have. We yeah. have again. <laughs> we have She'll be back them. in a minute. She must have yeah, touched the screen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, here she is. <laughs> Did you touch oh, your screen again? <laughs> yeah, there you are. Sorry for that. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. But yes, I mean, you brought up an is interesting point here. Okay, so with regards to looking at celebrities and sportsmen and uh, musicians and so forth, as your role model, and you said about it, like feeding the ego. We are to blame, the public are to blame for this as well, because we're the ones that feed it. We're the ones that allow it to happen. Um, we accept, um, when there's bad behavior from them, if they treat you badly or what have you, how how often are we told when we're children you can't say that you can't do that you know they're important no they're human beings and if they've got a lot of yes people around them it changes your personality you get used to people doing your bidding and it's addictive and then you're looking for that external validation so, you know, again, how we talk to our children about famous sportsmen, famous movie stars, at the end of the day, they're human beings. They're trying to put food on the plate, a roof over their heads. They're no better than anyone. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. If we think about this, if we think about uh, famous people in sport or celebrities, first of all, they become well known because they are talented. They have a, a specific talent, a special oh, talent. And not so, so much today. <laughs> Look at reality yeah, TV. Yeah, that's, that's one. That's one field. But some what? sport people, some sport people or some singers, uh, writers, yeah. they are talented, they have yeah. a talent. And that's what comes in the forefront. And so we are no longer able as a public to see their shadow, what mm -hmm. is called their shadow, what is less attractive, because we know them for what they are talented for. And this is the risk. This is why there's so much uh, focus on what they, they do well, what they've done well. And as soon as they are no longer on track with that, we are ready to criticize. And we are so surprised mm -hmm. because we kind of idealize them. No, they have a very specific talent. They are amazing with that. And it's a blessing. But they're also, as you say, done a human being. And therefore, we have to think there is a shadow behind yeah. their big persona yeah yeah exactly i mean you know why should somebody just jump the queue um just because they're famous do you, do you know what i mean and also another interesting fact is the fact that children it's definitely in my generation when they were asked what did they want to become when they were older and it was fireman nurse doctor policeman stuff like this and now it's, I want to be a reality star. I want to be like, well, I'm not going to mention their names, but do, do you see what I mean? That's shifted as well. Um, when I think about role models, I like the ones that, again, are creative, think outside the box, but also stand up for what's right who have quite a strong moral compass, who, you know, 
treat people regardless of sex, gender, I mean, you know, sexual preferences, religion, they are good salt of the earth people. They're not um, immune to rolling up their sleeves and working alongside you and they uplift and they want what's best for their families, their communities. So I love those kinds of people, but I also look for people that have that calming <laughs> effect because whilst I love all the energy, you get tired <laughs> and you need, you need people that help you to breathe be still. And what, what I really find interesting now is that within this discussion, for me, we uncovered another dimension of role model, because initially we started talking about the characteristics and what we like and the values, etc. But then the other dimension is actually visibility. Yeah. So the more visibility these people that are talking about celebrities, they're just the more visibility they have the more we project or people make, may consider them as role models. They didn't ask to be role models. So there are two dimensions of it. As, as long as we have visibility, mm -hmm. we are potentially role models. That's it. Yeah. True? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's and we're role models in our two family. Dimensions. Yeah, it's like two dimensions. doesn't need specifically to be the values. That's the more visibility there are, sometimes is enough for some people to project. That's it. Mm -hmm the values may become with um experience i'm not gonna say age um <laughs> thank you <laughs> with with more experience etc but that means also there's a responsibility the more visibility there's a responsibility yeah. for the fact that the more visibility we have we the more we need to be careful of what we are projecting and then second that we're all visible at some point of time even to our close um circle so we need anyway to uh to be having this awareness that we might be seen as role models in a good way or in a bad way yeah no i agree and i'm i apologize i we've just got a message uh a comment here and it's for you sylvia hmm. so i am just going to put this up can you read that Yes, very interesting. Sylvia, could you elaborate on the projection topic you mentioned and what the effect of projection is? Yes, we talked earlier about um, projection is uh, somehow reflecting on another person um, characteristics that uh, we may have that are positive, but are also negative. And so, for example, Let's, let's take the example of a negative characteristic. Uh, someone may be arrogant and short-tempered. And uh, when this person encounters another person, maybe in a meeting, in a conversation, that shows the same characteristics, arrogant and short-tempered, short we may just say, wow, wasn't that rude, you know? Um, and we attach. Um, judgments, adjectives to that person that are exactly what we can do because maybe we are ourselves short-tempered and arrogant, but we want to disown that characteristic and therefore we, we project it completely onto the other person. We project all the time, actually. We do project yeah. all the time. And it's an unconscious process, uh, but I think it's an interesting process to look into, just to be aware um, of how another person, personality, behavior, could actually say something about us and could help us discover something about who we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I know she's. I don't know. She is. Out today. <laughs> there she is. There she is again. No, but you make a good point. And also, a lot of the times, people aren't. They don't put their hands up to be a role model. And how many, you know, we've said this to our children, you know, you're the older brother or you're the older sister, you're a role model for the, you know, for the younger ones. And it was just like, well, hold on a second. I got to be the eldest out of you know, potluck, really. Um, and that's when we need to define those roles and ask them what's their definition 
how would they like an older brother or sister to to treat them and to behave so there's you know there has to be that communication and somebody's yes. enjoying our program thank you so much <laughs> So what else? Uh, for work, how would you like your leaders, your um, superiors to be? What kind of traits would you like for them to have as a role model, you know, to their reports, basically? I, I think if I may go, um, there is, first of all, if you're a leader, um, having a direction because mm -hmm. people are um, much more clear and inspired when the leader is showing them in a humble and gentle way as well, not so pushy or arrogant, the way, the direction. The, we also want leaders that are open and transparent in the sense that they can delegate to the team what the team can do best because a leader is not necessarily a perfect person that knows everything yeah. the leader is there to set their direction to listen to the team to empower the team to delegate but eventually create cohesion between uh, himself herself and the team and also create cohesion and communication, understanding with the external world, because obviously a team is communicating often with the external world, selling or pro providing very valuable services. But I do think that an authentic, humble leader who can provide a direction is someone I would, um, again, be inspired by personally. Yeah, yeah. Jihan, I can see you sitting there, ready. <laughs> <laughs> My chair, my chair. Uh, okay. Um, for me, what's important for a leader, because it's a, a leader by definition also have a team, whether it's reporting directly to him or not, but the leader by definition will inspire others to do some actions. And when we say inspire, he's not telling them what to do. Uh, he's not um, motivating them on, on what they need to do. It's inspiring. And inspiring means they need to trust him. So a lot of the issues that we see between leaders and teams is an issue of trust. Do I trust this person? Do I trust him that he's going to do the work? Do I trust that I can be open and transparent? So a leader for me as a role, as a role model needs to be to give trust. He needs to earn the trust of his mm -hmm. team. Before demanding the trust, he needs to earn it. And earning it means, as Sylvia was saying, of being humble. I will say being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And being vulnerable, uh, because that's what I see, there's a lot of disconnect sometimes. We think as leaders, we need to be strong. Mm -hmm. And as Sylvia was saying, show the vision. So even in times of uncertainty and change, we sometimes don't know where we're going. But I'm a leader, I need to be strong. I think that's the wrong approach. A leader would say, I'm not sure where we're going. I'm, I might not be even... 100% sure about the results, and I might do, I make mistakes, but I believe in this team and that together we can go to this direction. So showing that kind of vulnerability is, someone said, it's earned trust. To earn mm -hmm. something, you need a currency, you need to spend something. And the currency to earn trust is vulnerability. It's for a leader to show that He's vulnerable, that he can be overwhelmed, that he can make mistakes, and it's okay. We're still moving forward. That's how they connect more with others. So that's the kind of thing yeah. that would inspire me. Yeah. Okay, so what's coming up for me is okay, if, okay, so you've got those on the ground, then you've got middle leadership, and then you've got senior. Okay. I think for, the top people to show too much vulnerability, too much uncertainty is going to make everybody really nervous. So to have some form of, you know what, guys, we don't know what is going to happen here, but together we will figure it out. And whatever happens, I will have your back. Yeah. Your, you know, that intention. Because I think sometimes when, as soon as, 
you know, you start talking about mindfulness and vulnerability, some people can go completely the opposite direction and people lose faith in no, them. It's not weakness. Vulnerability doesn't mean, oh, I don't know where to go and everything is not going well, etc. I'm just saying, this is what we can control. Mm -hmm. And I am here for you on what we can control. This is what we can't control. And let's be realistic. We can't control that. And that's still okay because I'm here for you yeah. for this. Yeah. This reminds me a lot of one of the Hogan scales uh, we go and test for leaders which is the emotional stability. And we say that that's a very important scale for a leader. You're, you're right, Jen, you can be vulnerable and um, um, maybe feel um, emotional as well. You may have an emotion, but it's how the leader can stay calm under pressure and manage the emotion, be aware of the emotions his emotion, her emotion, the emotion of the teens as well, that bring calm into mm -hmm. it and control. That's the emotional stability. And uh, that can come with vulnerability too. They can coexist. But imagine if, if there is a person that has is vulnerable, but at the same time is highly uh, volatile and excitable, that is something that is going to shake possibly the team in a, in a, in a negative way because the, the team members are not, don't know anymore where they stand, how they should go about something. But being calm and at the same time assertive mm. is um, a valuable um, soft skill. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it is because especially when you're, you're dealing with so many different characters, so many different personalities, so many different expectations as well. So, um, you know, I think one important trait for, you know, leaders to have is to impart that ownership onto us as well. So we're not just employed, we're engaged, we, we're part of the solution. Um, I'm going to let you two carry on talking. I just need to cough. <laughs> Sorry, one second. And Sylvia, there was another uh, measurement in the Hogan assessment, specifically about, I don't remember the name exactly now, but you know, and being too confident and too assertive and how can that backfire also in terms mm -hmm. of, right? Yes, yes. It's the... Um, it has to do with the emotional stability on one side, someone that is uh, very self-confident and sure, and is also connected to the level of ambition that the person uh, has. So let's assume a person is really self-confident and therefore is calm because they are confident that things are going well and everything is on track, but at the same time they're very ambitious and I mean competitive. They really mm. want to win. They're really 100% focused on goals. Then they risk, there's a risk factor there to become arrogant, to become pushy towards your team because you want to achieve something and you also want them to have the same um, pace like you have, you know, highly ambitious, highly, highly focused on goals that can be um, a disadvantage. So this is why we say leaders need to look at their shadow. So what is the uh, positive aspects, the talent, the, the soft skills that you manage well? You know, you, you are uh, calm and so self-confident, you are ambitious, but these have to be managed because when they become too much, it's an over strength. It's a it's a strength that is overused. Then you 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 can uh, have a negative effect on your team. As I said earlier, become arrogant, become pushy. Yeah, it's a bit. You know, it's about that awareness of all those aspects, isn't it? Um, and you know, you can't be as a leader, overly sympathetic and getting really involved in your employee's personal life and going home and worrying about everybody, you know, there has to be some boundaries put in place. So Good um, word, good word, the boundaries yeah. that we all yeah. need to put in place, leaders too, because sometimes I think we have unrealistic expectations from leaders because leader, leaders are 
obviously seen and heard by by everyone and sometimes we really place uh, very high expectations unrealistic expectations on them they are human being as well yeah. and that's where we need to be compassionate to our you know senior leadership and say well hold on a second you know we've got these people to complain to and point the finger when things aren't going well and it's all directed to them you know when how often do we pause and say thank you you're doing a great job i love the way you did this i love the way you did this presentation you know not not a lot of people actually take that time to do that and and to hold that space for them so um right before we sign off what tips tools would you suggest for people to think about maybe this is more of an awareness exercise i don't know you tell me when looking at role models or bestowing that title to somebody hmm. I think for me, it's um, going back to, it's a little bit of awareness, but also saying, and I'm going to put back, what's the, what's the goal of having a role model? Like for me, a role model is one, when you see someone achieve or at a place that you'd love to achieve to. If we admire them, as Sylvia said from the beginning, means we'd love to be there, or we'd love to have that specific characteristic. So I think one of the things is just be very clear to say, if you have a goal, you can use the role model saying, okay, I want to achieve this. Who else has this? Mm -hmm. This specific, maybe that person, if it's success in the career, maybe that person, I'm not going to take him as a role model for his personal or family life, yeah. but I take him as a role model for maybe the, the way he communicates or the way he presents. And then identify that specifically and identify your person because it's much easier than to model the behavior and see so how is this person doing it how they are what's the steps what do i like what i don't like and then take that and put it in place mm -hmm. so use the role model in your advantage saying this is my target who i can see that really display already this kind of behavior and let me observe them or ask them questions or see how they are doing it take what relates to me and then just replicate that because that's that's the thing back to nlp is really about whoever is doing something the right way you just need to know how they're doing it yeah and then you 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 should be able to do the same yeah great great answer uh sylvia yeah i'm on the same page with you and mm -hmm. i have to say i think yeah. uh, we'll hey, yeah. to uh, to, to a role model, um, I would um, recommend people look at the behavior of the person they are admiring. You know, what do they do uh, well, actually, that yeah. inspires you? And so make a list of uh, actions or words they say or behavior in a situation that you may find challenging and you think, wow, look how they... Uh, manage this situation. So really a list of behaviors and um, see if you can um, find the courage to um, follow some of these behavior, make them yours. Because in the end, it's about how the person acts. It's about the yeah. facts, you know, walk the talk. Then if you admire a role model for certain things that the role model does, then make them yours and eventually walk the talk. Yeah, and I, I, again, I'm on the same page as you two. Um, however, you've got to remember that you've got to look at the skills and break it down rather than take on the whole personality. That's their journey. Their character, their, their map of the world is very, very personal. So, you know, sometimes they'll behave in a certain way. They, look, they could be great at their job, but a terrible husband or a terrible mother, or a terrible friend, what have you. Or they could be a fantastic mother, father, and they're disorganized at work. And, you know, so I, I think you've got to break it down. 
and really, as you said, look at the skills. What did they do? How many hours did they do? Who did they talk to? What did they read? What courses did they do? If this is where you want to get to, um, but be careful of putting them on that pedestal because again, they are human. Everybody's human. They're going to have a dark side. They're going to have a light side. So be gentle <laughs> to them and to yourself. Yeah, which means for me, just be gentle also with yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's the other thing too, because sometimes you can be very harsh and very hard with ourselves. So we just need to remember that within this journey or whatever we want to achieve or change, just to be gentle also with with ourselves and yeah, be kind. It starts yeah. with us. Role modeling starts with us and being kind starts with us. 100%. Right, ladies, I just want to say a huge thank you once again. Um, as always, it's always an interesting conversation. Never know where it's going to go, what's going to come up. And um, it was nice to have you popping in and out, Jihan. <laughs> Made it interesting. <laughs> so for tonight, I will say good night and thank you very much. And we will see you again next Wednesday. Good night, everyone. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you, Donna. Good night, everyone. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.